policy-oriented implications of 3D printing uh, related to some, some of the questions that came up last time about intellectual property, but going beyond that to education and some manufacturing policy issues. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is so interesting about the technology is just how much potential this has to be disruptive. You can think that when industrialization came, um, it gave us mass production, this move out of small-time manufacturing in the home and shop into the factory. And I think 3D printing has the potential to move us back the other way into an era of new customization, but also potentially bringing manufacturing back um, into smaller spheres. Um, the Economist made this argument um, in a piece a couple of months ago. And I think that's just one way you can see how disruptive this could be. So we're going to open um, our talk about policy with introductions for our panelists, and then we're going to jump into a discussion, and then we're going to try and have lots of time uh, for your questions. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Melba? Hi. My name is Melba Kerman. I'm a writer and I run a small consulting firm um, so with, where I help people to try to make better sense of the ecosystem around federal government research, university, research labs, and companies. Um, so my primary area of focus is university technology, innovative university technology, and how to take these cutting edge inventions and innovations and get them actually into play. Not just commercial use, but into play, meaning education and that sort of thing as well. I became interested in what I call personal scale manufacturing. Um, 3D printing is a great example of personal scale manufacturing, but it is, it is one type. When I say personal scale manufacturing and design tools, I mean actually a factor, what used to be a factory powered machine has become small and cheap enough that someone can actually purchase one for home use and make things at home that used to be made in factories. Um, to me, personal scale manufacturing technologies are disruptive because they are meta-technologies. So when I say meta-technologies, I mean a technology that is going to have a profound ripple effect um, and it's going to impact a whole lot of other technologies, breed new business models and new inventions as it continues to move into the mainstream. Um, great examples of meta-technologies are, of course, the personal computer, the internet, cheap transistors, so my sense is that manufacturing machines are, are hitting the same tipping point, that they are um, indeed going to become something that we're intimately familiar with and are within reach of regular people. So where I got into this particular situation <laughs> is um, I co-authored a report that was commissioned by the, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy with um, Todd Lipson from Cornell University. And we actually brought it today. It's in a box somewhere, and so please take one. Um, it's floating around somewhere here. But um, basically, the, the, the report attempts to pull together the, the big picture for the non-expert. One of the interesting things when we were doing research for this report is almost every single person trying to create a business or trying to somehow get a foothold in this world of emerging personal manufacturing technologies, the first thing they said when we, when we asked them, what is your chief concern? What do you see as your biggest barrier between you and really making this fly, they said it's intellectual property issues. They're vague, they don't necessarily fit, we've got copyrights, patents, trademarks, but we don't know how that's going to play out into this, into this new arena. Um, so I would feel comfortable right now actually saying that in general, technology is evolving faster than our legal system is able to keep up with. Um, as someone who works with universities and takes a look at what happens when really cutting edge early stage research comes out of a university lab and is, is you know encounters industry, um, we're discovering that innovation need is, is constantly pushing the limits of our current tools of, of intellectual property structures or IP law uh, IP structures. So I believe that this this new wave of personal scale manufacturing tools, which hasn't even hit yet, as people were talking about in the previous panel, um, we don't, our, our IP system is going to be tested. And what I hope happens, uh, helped by events like today, is that the dialogue this time is different. About uh, 15 years ago, when the internet started to really hit, enter into people's lives, the, we, we got the, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. 
And that wasn't passed, I think, in a very constructive way. There was a lot of people who didn't know what the internet was. There was a lot of fear that there were these people called pirates and hackers that were going to rip off companies and copy, make copies of music and video. This time around, everybody's more sophisticated. And I think it's great that Michael um, and has organized an effort to try to get us all together to get people to have a rational discussion that's fact-based, not fear-based. And we're, we're really going to have to stretch to try to rethink how we're going to interpret and make good law, good IP policy around these new technologies. Thank you, Melba. Uh, I'm Michael Weinberg. I work at Public Knowledge. For those of you who don't know Public Knowledge, we are an advocacy group, a nonprofit advocacy group, advocacy group here in Washington. And broadly, what we do is a lot of internet policy. And that mostly combines communications policy, things that happen at the FCC, and then a lot of copyright policy and then how we deal with the innovation and intellectual creative creations when they're online. And we cut our teeth in a lot of those digital copyright arguments, a lot of arguments about music and movies and books and all of these things being passed around online. And uh, a couple years ago, we started internally realizing, and, and realizing now we're kind of late to the game in some ways, realizing there's this technology floating around, this 3D printing technology, that it has a lot of the same characteristics of, kind of network <laughs> computers. It is a technology that is, potential, is it a meta technology, is a very good way to put it, that has a potential to be very disruptive. And disruption is a good thing, disruption is a bad thing. Uh, I think ultimately it is a beneficial thing, but it certainly is not a, a clean thing. And so we realized that if we were going to be serious about being an organization that thinks through how new innovative things can really be brought to market and can come to be, we needed to give a little bit of thought about how intellectual property law will apply to this, not because intellectual property law is necessarily the primary lens that should be used to view this technology, and I think we'll talk about that a little bit later, but because it is clear that intellectual property law is a lens that will be natural for many people to, to think about it. And, and we'll have, there are a number of sort of intellectual property angles that need to be considered in this technology. So we had some time, we put together this white paper and we've begun thinking, thinking it through and it's, it's a really interesting opportunity because when you have a physical world, it's so different than a digital world in so many ways. One of the ways is, is an important legal way, which is unlike the digital world where so much of it almost by default is protected by copyright just by the nature of what it is. But the physical world doesn't have those sorts of automatic protections from birth. And that's something that is very hard for, for someone who has come from a number of years of thinking about digital copyright issues to, to remember from, as a starting point. And so I'm sort of conflicted as someone because I, I, I think about the intellectual property ramifications and I think they're very important and very important to discuss well, at the same time, I feel like every time I discuss them, I have to begin with the caveat that this should not be the only way that we think about this technology, and it should not be the, the horse that drives the cart of 3D printing in a lot of ways. Great. Thanks for those introductions. Uh, Melba, I want to start by picking up on something you would, you would said. Um, you know, we've seen the digitization of media has led to the copyright wars over the last 10 or 15 years. And now as we enter this era of the digitization of the physical world, there's obviously the potential for similar kinds of clashes. But I think you said you think it's going to be different this time. And I wonder if you could elaborate on that. OK. Um, I think that in part because I'm an optimist, and in part maybe because I'm also 10 years older uh, than I was the first time around. But I do believe that things are going to be different for a number of reasons. Um, the first is that because of all the introduction of and the radical changes that have come about to the way we live our lives, the way people are trying to form small businesses, the, the speed at which technologies are prototyped, brought to market, um, and the way people share information, and that the whole notion of inventorship has become a lot more crowdsourced. That's a popular phrase people like to toss around these days. Meaning that this, this notion of the lone genius who's working in a linear fashion towards some brilliant patent People are kind of wising up and realizing that that's not how new products are made, that's not where new ideas come from. 
So I, I think that the internet and a lot of the accompanying social media have, have brought us to this point where people are not only trying to make money in new ways, but we're also designing and thinking and innovating and sharing information in new ways. So my, my sense is, is that, first of all, everybody's more sophisticated. So the, the, a lot of the discussion that went into updating copyright law to deal with online media, that seemed to take place behind closed doors. And maybe that's not true, maybe that wasn't intentional, but I do think that this time around, especially if people here do things right, is that there is going to be a far more open discussion and it's not going to be quite so easy to paint the big music companies, the pirates, and the hapless consumers the way it was done before. The second is I think that the ecosystem of, of commerce is, is a lot more nuanced now as well, and particularly in the world of physical products. So the world of, of media is relatively simple. There's RCA, there's, uh, I don't know, Disney, um, but there's not that many companies that are fiercely protective of their copyright. If you look at the world of products, um, it suddenly it's an incredibly diverse ecosystem and there is a number of different niches, companies of different sizes, and their agenda is not nearly as unified as it was um, 15 years ago. And then finally, I earlier, I think it was Bree was talking about his first DMCA takedown. And I was actually disappointed to hear that the happy ending was that the information, the invention, was released into the public domain. Not because I don't think the public domain is a wonderful thing, but I think there should be other happy endings available. And so, coming from the university technology transfer world, one of the things that universities work very hard to do is to try to foster the growth of small businesses. I became a small business last fall. Um, we are all working very hard to try to create more jobs. And so, it shouldn't be just that it's simple. It's either patent equals big company, or if you're a small maker or a, a small creator or an inventor, then you equal open, uh, you equal public domain. I think that the discussion needs to be more nuanced this time around, and I actually think there are going to be surprises when you see the evolution of somebody's mental place where they invent or they create something, they realize that they can actually now sell it on eBay, on Amazon, there's a number of retail channels that weren't available um, 10, 15 years ago, and then they go, wow, I can make money off of this. And then the next question is, but what if someone copies it and suddenly they've just woken up to the whole world of IP law. So I think we're going to discover this time around, not only is everyone more sophisticated and we're, we're talking a lot more, but I think we're going to find some pretty interesting bedfellows <laughs> who find themselves on, this, on the same side in ways that 10, 15 years ago would not have happened. I think everything was more simple back then. Like those are going to be different this time? Uh, I think it will inevitably be different. Uh, I, I hope that it will be substantively different. I think it's, this is a good point that 15 years ago, one of the things that didn't exist was the discussion that has been going on for the last 15 years. Uh, there wasn't this level of awareness. Uh, people which weren't thinking about how intellectual property, copyright, how all these things work, how innovation really exists, because for most people, the creative acts that they were involved in weren't widely distributed. And the widely distributed creative acts that they experienced, they weren't really connected to. And so it, it was true that if I wrote a, you know, if I wrote a short story and I, or I drew, if I drew a picture in my house, it was protected by copyright, but it didn't really matter because it wasn't leaving my house. It wasn't going anywhere, and so it was irrelevant. And if I saw a movie, the fact that you know, it was illegal to copy that movie was also irrelevant because they, there was no way for me to copy that movie. And so now we have had this, this, these 15 years of people really thinking these issues through. And one of the things that's come out of it that has been really interesting is that in addition to thinking, OK, it's very hard to draw these lines of where is the creator, where is the innovation, who is adding what, who is stealing what, you also have this growth of study of very profitable industries that don't necessarily rely on very strong intellectual property protections at their core. Uh, we have some, my office mate, Katie Tasker, is very interested in some of the, the fashion and fashion copyright issues. In fashion, the clothes business is a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, but in the clothes business, by and large, you can copy whatever you want. 
and innovation happens there at this incredibly rapid pace. No one would say there's no creativity or innovation in the clothes business, and there are other ways that the community has built up to handle problems related to copying. I think that's part of the reason that the, I, I, I like Bree's uh, DMCA takedown story a little bit, and probably more than you, because while, yeah, maybe it's not great that there's this binary line between public domain and, 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 and some sort of copyright protection, there were, what, what dominated that discussion at the end of the day was a set of community norms that the community, first of all, decided they were not gonna rely primarily on copyright, on trademark, on patent. Instead, they were gonna rely on community norms, and that pretty much worked. Uh, dedicating the object to the public domain was the, was the outcome of that solution, but that's a community, if you look at Thingiverse, look at other communities like that, where it's very important to cite things. It's very important to say, this is where I got an idea from. It is not critical that you pay a licensing fee. It is not critical that you say, well, 40% of this thing came from place X, and 20% came from place Y, and then the other 40%, that's me, and be able to draw these hard lines that is becoming increasingly clear, you know, it's not impossible to do, it is very, very hard. And so thinking, one of the gifts of the last 15 years is this idea that there are many ways to both protect creation and monetize creation that don't necessarily involve extended trips to court and, and very expensive lawsuits. Yeah, so IP issues are going to be big here, but you mentioned your opening statement. I know you're a big proponent of this idea that we don't want to look at this just through the lens of IP. And I wonder if you could say more about that, what the alternatives then are for looking at these things and how we uh, disseminate those ideas. And one of, the, one of the things that was very hard for me to understand when, when we started looking at some of the IP issues was that unlike in the digital space, I mentioned this before, unlike in a digital space where everything is pretty much protected by, let's, let's just say, let's say copyright, and I'll, I know that I'm overgeneralizing here, you know, everything online as moments is created is protected by copyright. That no, no one has to do anything, there's no test for it, it basically is protected by copyright, or at least you have to assume as much. And in the physical world, that simply isn't true, right? I mean, this, this box here that houses all these components, most of it is not protected by anything, right? If I copied this box uh, on a MakerBot or on a 3D printer, or if I went, and went home and, and banged it out out of wood and, and bent some metal around, by and large, I bet that there's nothing that the creator of this box could do to sue me for infringement. Uh, this table, probably is not protected by any sort of intellectual property. And the act of copying it is not illegal, unlike a movie or a song where the simple act of copying is probably illegal. And a fear that I, that I have is that as 3D printing becomes broader, you will see industries that are concerned about this disruption and come in and say, this, this is a loophole in intellectual property law. This is a mistake from the past that needs to be updated because it was just something that nobody was thinking about before and now that we have these new technologies, uh, we really need to, to close this loophole and expand, expand the universe of intellectual property. Excuse me. And I think it's really important to point out that's not a loophole. You know, there, there's a reason that most physical objects are not protected by copyright. And first of all, it's because, or by intellectual property. And one of those reasons is, you don't need to protect them with intellectual property to get them made, right? Society has tables without copyright for tables. Society has chairs for copy, without copyright for chairs. We don't need to give someone a monopoly of their lifetime plus 70 years to convince them to create these physical objects. 3D, this isn't the 3D printers, doesn't change that. So expanding intellectual property law when confronted with this new disruptive technology has a great deal of cost on society. And, and so when I, when I say, you know, we don't want to look primarily through the lens of intellectual property, so much of what these things will be able to do is outside the scope of intellectual property, doesn't necessarily touch on intellectual property, and if we decide to try and think about it through intellectual property first, we miss most of it. Yeah, I wonder if 
if you guys could talk about some possible tweaks that we might want to see to the existing IP regime. So while a lot of things might be outside of it, what do we need to do to change the current system? Um, because obviously there will be plenty of things that are covered by IP that we need to address. I think Melba has, has some ideas about micro patents and other things. And I wonder if you could tell us more about, about that. Yeah, and before I dive into to, to these suggestions, is um, I wanted to add to your point that we don't want to just look at this through the lens of IP only, um, because in part that takes away the excitement of these emerging technologies. Um, and I think also that this previous panel really touched on this well. So there's a whole lot of other barriers right now that are creating these technologies from entering the mainstream. So IP isn't even yet a problem. Um, and maybe we can talk about that, that in a bit. But with that said, um, I'm, I was thinking about different methods and what could we do to stretch the current intellectual property system. Now this is creative. <laughs> There's a lot of great minds in the room today, trained attorneys who are going to be able to very much shoot these ideas full of holes, that's fine. But what I want to do today is toss out some ideas just to get people thinking and talking and stretching in new ways. So if you look at um, the way I'm going to sort of th think in a new way is, is along a spectrum. So if you first think about, okay, using the current um, IP system that we have in place, Let's say that we start having these electronic blueprints for certain designs. People have a 3D printer at home or a you know, CNC milling machine on their kitchen table. They're going to make something at home. We are concerned that the person who created the electronic software blueprint is going to not be able to control for the fact that he or she's trying to build a business on this. So enter iTunes. Um, for those of you with an iPod or an iPhone, you're probably buying music all the time, but these days, Apple, for better or for worse, I know that not everybody loves how Apple has done this, but you can buy a song for 99 cents and you get to do whatever you want at home with it. You can play the song 24-7 if you want, um, but you can't go sell that song that you downloaded. Um, and there's also a set number of copies that you can you know, actually re reproduce. So that could be one way, without stretching a whole lot, that we could start to put a little bit of a commercial structure around the, the world of um, electronic design blueprints. Going a little bit more to the middle of the spectrum, this is a, an idea called Fab Apps. And it was actually created by Jeffrey Lipton. That's the guy. If you want to complain, go to him. <laughs> um, so Jeff's a grad student at Cornell University, and he's leading the Fab at Home team. So the idea of uh, Fab App is that there would be sort of like an iTunes app. Um, you would select a Fab App, and instead of purchasing or obtaining an electronic blueprint, uh, what you would do instead is say you wanted to create a certain type of fantastic toothbrush at home. You would go to the Fab App store and you would download the toothbrush app, and it would cost $2 or something. So how is this different from an electronic blueprint? It's different because you don't download the actual blueprint. You download access to a tool that's going to walk you through some questions, a, a sort of simple interface, color, how tall are you, you know, do you want your face curved into it, upload the photo, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, and people don't want their face. Yeah, I want my face in my <laughs> um, So, so then you you complete the, the you click submit, and then the app actually talks straight to your 3D printer or your machine at home, and voila, you have the the object that you purchased. Um, this sidesteps the whole notion of the actual file coming down and uh, going into the wild, as it were, and becoming reproduced endlessly or you know, being lost. The most radical idea is a, an addition to our current patent system. Um, uh, this we actually created last summer when we wrote this report. Um, Hod Lipson and I dreamed up this idea of a micro-patent. So since I work a lot with small businesses who are trying to tap into university inventions, one thing that they're pretty keenly aware of is they would like some patents, and a patent portfolio is pretty much a key part of your business strategy these days, just as much as your marketing strategy is, or your uh, operational strategy. But patents are really expensive. On average, a patent will cost $40,000 to obtain, and it takes about three to five years. The average small entrepreneur cannot afford such a patent. So given the fact that there's a lot more producers now, and given the fact that people are getting access to design tools and their own making technologies, 
we have the potential to have an explosion of creativity, which I think is fantastic, but how do we make that also equal an explosion of business models and, and people actually you know, feeding themselves, making jobs? So the idea of a micro-patent is, is rather than going through the expensive and long process of actually getting a patent through the U.S. Patent Office the way you do now, is it would, it would borrow from copyright. You would actually apply for a micro-patent and the act of application would mean you have a micro-patent. The uh, limitation would be on field of use. So this would prevent people from being patent trolls and just filing everything. So you would get a, for four, a few hundred dollars you would apply for your micro-patent. It would be limited to, to extremely pre precise and very few fields of use. And uh, similar also to a copyright, you don't have to pay any attorneys anything and, unless you get yourself in trouble, unless someone challenges you. To also prevent the uh, phenomenon of patent trolls, um, like a trademark, it's only good if it's in commercial play. So someone can't just go file willy-nilly and get themselves a ton of micro patents and then sit there and say, come on and get me. Um, so. This would be, I think, a more radical suggestion and something that if there are any policymakers in the room today, that they, they, I would invite you to consider as just a way to stretch and expand the current system. I would say I, I, I like the first two ideas. I love this paper. I hate the ideas of micro <laughs> uh, I, I <coughs> My fear, when, when, I, when, I, when I hear about micro patents, I hear the creation of a new minefield of things that a that someone who is starting needs to be aware of coming through, and especially if it is a low barrier to filing, and just there's going to be many of these things, and it's going to be something that people are worried about. And you know, I'm happy to be, be proved wrong, but one of the things that I think is important to think about when I think about these issues is to avoid. Avoid giving the power of the state, the power of law, to a new kind of creator unless you absolutely have to. Because copyrights, copyright is great, patent is great, trademark is great, um, but in practice it, it both helps and harms people who are trying to do innovative things. And it inevitably is a double-edged sword. And so, the creation of either new kinds of rights or the extension of rights can always be described in a way that sounds great to a new innovator. But very quickly, it becomes clear almost every time that it also becomes very dangerous to those same new innovators uh, coming down the line. And so the thing that I, I hope governs the mid middle phase, early phase, or phase you want to consider the next couple of years of 3D printing is actually not a rush to try and enshrine things in law. And the, from, from someone who is a Washington policy person, this may seem like a strange statement, but is to actually avoid enshrining these things in law and instead really look to, to the community and community norms. And this sounds kind of like a hippy dippy, oh, we should all be cool and give everything away. And, and really, that, that's not what I'm trying to say. But this is a fast developing, fast moving world. And if we try and pick a moment in time and say, well, this is how we're going to understand how creation works in this space. And let's enshrine it in law and give people, give creators rights that they can use. Almost inevitably, especially in a fast moving space, from five years from now, we realize we didn't quite understand what was going to be going on. And we've, we've formalized a structure that wasn't quite baked yet. And so what I really hope is the next five, ten years, whatever it is, next period of time, is focused on finding ways for kind of community self-policing. And only when that process breaks down, and breaks down irrevocably, do we then say, okay, or, or it's clear it's going to break down, we have to wait for the, the walls to collapse in on us and the roof to be burying us. But only when it's clear that a, a system that does not require lawyers to get involved has emerged, then do we say, okay, we need real, solid, backupable in court rules of the road to govern how to deal with this. But that is the best, the backup plan to me. The, the first plan is, is it possible for this to develop like fashion, 
like 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 the cooking industry, like the you know haircut industry, all of these industries that have managed to find a way to police themselves internally without dragging everyone to court and finding a way to drag everyone to court. All the time. Yeah. So stepping back a little bit from thinking of specific things we could do, I know one one thing that a point that you make sometimes, Michael, is that the analogies we use to think about these things are actually really important because they're going to guide the sorts of laws uh, and policy suggestions we come up with. Um, and I, I think one example you gave was thinking about whether a, a 3D CAD file used to create these, these objects is more like a blueprint with its limited copyright protections or more like a photograph which has tremendous protection even um, for derivative works based on that. I wonder if you could say more about the ways we think about these types of things. Yeah, and all of, all policy making, all law in a new space is all about who who makes the most compelling analogy. Uh, and you, you do you have a world where you know a blueprint by and large is not super protectable by copyright because it is mostly courts have said it's mostly information. Right? It's, it's, it's information expression dichotomy. I won't get into it. But a blueprint is mostly information. There's only so many ways to say that this wall is going to be two feet thick and it's going to be at a right angle to this other wall and it's going to run this long. And so uh, there has to be a way to kind of free that information. A photograph, these paintings of uh, esteemed chairman of this committee around the room are all, uh, are all very much protected by copyright because uh, you know, there's a lot of kind of artistic expression going into painting a guy with a, a dog and you know, all the other things around, around that, are, that are going into it. And so you know, if you think about it, a 3D CAD file is a 3D CAD file a way to digitally represent whatever you're trying to do in a way that is kind of just the basic information and so shouldn't be given a whole lot of protection because it prevents other people from accessing that idea? Or is it this, this result of this incredible amount of creativity that the creator needs to be rewarded with intensely and given this huge monopoly on for their entire life plus 70 years? Uh, and how that begins to play out when you do see people creating things in CAD files and, and moving forward as it becomes a widespread question as opposed to the limited question it's been for a couple of industries could have a, have a huge impact because if, if that digital file is like a movie, um, then trading it around is going to be, and sending it around the internet is going to be a problem, especially if with a digital file for an object, there are multiple ways to represent that file digital, that object digitally that arrive at the same place, but look very different in code. And are those differences relevant or irrelevant? And in, as you said, I mean, the, the, the IP questions here are great and are gray and are not answered, but a lot of the process of answering them will be what analogies to things that we pretend we understand now are the strongest to be drawn. And if the copyright wars are any indication, there would probably be lots of cover analogies. Yes, no doubt. Um, <laughs> Many highways. Let's, let's, let's have one more question here, and then we're going to open it up to your questions. But I want to talk real briefly about education. This came up several times in the last panel. Uh, I think Hod Lipson mentioned bringing 3D printer to his son's classroom. Kids love this. Um, it could be a great tool for education, and he suggests putting one in every classroom. What roles does 3D printing you know, might it play in schools and university settings, and what policies, if any, should the government adopt as far as encouraging that? Well, I think the one of the biggest barriers right now to 3D printing is that there's nothing to really that interesting to make. And I hope I'm um, not saying something that's... Um, but when I say that, I mean to the, the, the regular consumer, the person who's not interested in making components, the person who's not interested in printing out something that's really specialized, like, oh, look, I can make a 3D version of this molecule. And I've seen time and time again with kids and with adults is it's not so much the technology. The average person isn't going to just draw, be drawn into tinkering because they love to tinker. That's a very special person. And I think that those people are great. They tend to be very brilliant and they invent a lot of stuff. But they don't, they don't represent the mainstream. So what is, what, uh, one, something that would really help pull these, in, these uh, technologies into broader awareness, including STEM education, would be if there was something really compelling and fun to make. When people want to get something done, they learn the technology. I think we've all had that experience. When there's something on the other end for you, you figure it out pretty quick. Um, so I, I think that one big challenge, and I actually I think you were referring to this earlier, is, is that there, there needs to be content. There needs to be some 
you know, fun CAD software. There needs to be really interesting stuff to make that has a relevance to most of our daily lives. That isn't a special science project that, that we do and we tinker when we have extra time. A lot of us have no spare time. Um, so, so I think that that's just one sort of big conceptual barrier right now that the average person doesn't yet know what they can do with this stuff. But I think a, a, a another barrier, and this is more of an external barrier, is the fact that a lot of schools actually don't really have the basic um, PC and internet infrastructure they need. And a lot of people find this hard to believe because most of us live in these very privileged bubbles where the kids, our kids and the kids we know go to very good schools. But if you go outside those bubbles and you actually look at what US public education is really like, a lot of schools have antiquated uh, PCs locked in a computer lab that nobody opens very much. They have internet access that's not nearly fast enough. So I think that the, for policymakers who really want to bring these fantastic tools into reach, um, they, the first step has to be a real commitment to the idea that this is technological infrastructure. You know, this isn't just, okay, we're gonna bring this new type of machine, leave it on the, the doorstop, and we'll check back in three months to get a report from you guys. There actually needs to be a real commitment to the fact that US schools need a strong technological infrastructure. They need good high-speed software, and that, that needs to be funded. Somebody's really gotta commit to that. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would add to that is that the other day I was trying to build something in, in SketchUp, which is the free kind of CAD software that is absolutely more than even I can handle and is very low power in itself. But I, I had a, a moment of insight into what you know my parents, my grandparents feel like when I'm trying to explain them something on a computer and they just don't see it. Because when I'm on a computer, you know, I, I get a computer. I understand how it works. I understand how I'm supposed to understand it and I get where I start, and where I start is actually many, many steps beyond this is a computer and this is what it does. And I sat down to try and design uh, it's just a, a little, little trinket, and I was sitting there staring at the screen and realized I don't, I have no idea how to represent this object visually in a CAD program. I don't, I don't know what the component pieces are, I don't know how I can relate those pieces to each other, how I can build it out of smaller, simpler pieces. And so the education part is really important because you really, you won't get, you will, you will get great innovative things today when you give people access to this kind of technology. But the real breakthrough happens when you put someone in front of it who doesn't have to go through those five steps of this is an object, this is a CAD program, here's, I, here's how I translate one from the other, but they, get, they sit down, all that is already done, and they can move on to, and here's a really great innovative thing I can do. And that all starts with, with education and getting the stuff into school early so kids come out ready to do that really hard, innovative, out there thing.